Hi, I'm your host, Dave Kemp, and this is Future Ear Radio. Each episode, we're breaking down one new thing, one cool new finding that's happening in the world of hearables, the world of voice technology. How are these worlds starting to intersect? How are these worlds starting to collide? What cool things are going to come from this intersection of technology? Without further ado, let's get on with the show. All right, so we are joined here today by two great guests, Sherry Eberts and Matt Hay. Um, Sherry, why don't you tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do? Great, so uh, I'm Sherry Eberts and I'm a hearing loss advocate and a writer and speaker and a big uh, patient advocate for people with hearing loss. And I also am the founder of livingwithhearingloss.com which is a blog and online community for people living with hearing loss. Awesome. And you're based in New York City, correct? I'm based in New York City. Awesome. Yeah, the, um, your blog is definitely one of the um, first blogs that I ever came across as I was in this industry. And it's definitely one of my go-to in terms of, um, you know, the the folks that are the end users, if you will, are the, the ones that are um, receiving the hearing aids that I write and I speak so much about. So it's great to have you on. Matt? Yeah, I'm Matt Hay. I'm on the, the north side of Indianapolis, and I'm the director of audiology sales for Redux. And Redux is a new drawing system for removing moisture from hearing aids or hearables. Um, I've been there about a year and helping to launch the audiology vertical uh, having dealt with hearing loss and then eventual deafness for over half of my life, uh, being able to work in an environment professionally where I can help people hear better was always kind of my dream. It just took me 42 years to realize that. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you both so much for coming on the podcast today. Um, the whole purpose of this conversation is really going to be around how, you know, living in this pandemic has been like, you know, for folks with hearing loss and different degrees of hearing loss. I obviously write and talk a lot about the technology and I talk a lot to, you know, speaking and writing for the professional, but I haven't really had anybody on the podcast yet that is, um, the people that actually have hearing loss. And so I thought it would be really cool to have this conversation with the pandemic as sort of a backdrop. Um, but before we even get into that, why don't we start, Sherry, with you? Can you just share with uh, me and Matt and the audience um, about your experience? Um, I saw on your blog that you developed or, or you had genetic hearing loss and in your mid-20s, you started to lose your hearing. Um, so I would just be really curious to hear about that whole process, that experience in terms of, you know, the, the onset and then when you started to seek treatment and then where you are today. Sure. So I first noticed my hearing loss in my mid-20s. I was in graduate school and pretty quickly into the first semester, I started realizing I was missing things in class, um, you know, whether it was a comment that was made under one's breath or a whole class would start laughing and I would be kind of looking around the room trying to figure out what was so funny. And um, it was not a surprise to me because I knew that my father had hearing loss um, and his mother had had it as well. So I was hoping that it would skip my generation, uh, but no such luck. And so I went to get that first hearing test and it was mild hearing loss. I was told, you know, just ignore it. There's nothing to do about it. And it was the perfect excuse for me to really ignore it and uh, live in denial for many, many years about my hearing loss. Um, my father was very stigmatized by his hearing loss and he had passed that down to me. So I really felt like this was just a terrible diagnosis to receive. I didn't know how I was gonna live my life with this. He eventually really isolated himself from his family, his friends, from everything. And I just looked at that and, and was so terrified. So, you know, denial for many, many years. But um, as I entered the workforce, there were meetings and clients that I just, I couldn't hear and I couldn't participate. And so I knew I needed to go get a hearing aid. And so I did, but I continued to really um, live with that stigma and hide it as best I could from everyone that I know uh, and knew only the closest of you know friends and family really were privy to uh, the hearing aids and I would only wear them when I absolutely had to. 
But then I had children of my own and I worried that maybe I will have passed it on to them because it is genetic. And so I realized that I was modeling the same poor stigmatized behavior that my father had modeled with hiding it and laughing at jokes I hadn't heard. And so I knew that I really needed to make a change for them. And so I did. And I started telling everyone about my hearing aids. I started uh, being coming really on my path to advocacy. And um, what I really love now is my ability to share my story and sort of overcoming this stigma. And I really hope that it helps other people to live much easier with their own hearing loss issues. No, that's awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. And can you talk a little bit about the Living with Hearing Loss blog? Like you said, I think it's so cool that... Um, you know, you obviously recognized that it's counterproductive to live with this stigmatization. And obviously, it's something where the more people that advocate for it, the less the stigma really resonates. Um, what has been some of the response that you've gotten, you know, from, because I would imagine that some of the motivation that you've gotten to continue writing as long as you have, um, what, ha what have been some of the responses that have really stuck with you? Yeah, it's really been incredible. I mean, when I started it, I guess it was really back in 2014, and it was almost therapy in a way. You know, it was almost, I'm going to just put myself out there. I'm going to be, you know, brave and, and break the stigma. And it was incredible, the response that I got. I think the first post was about, like, how do you tackle Thanksgiving dinner? Because I was really <laughs> worried about, you know, going to Thanksgiving and not being able to hear and feeling marginalized. And I realized that I was just not alone in feeling this. I mean, so many people were worried about that particular event. And then yeah. it led to, you know, how do you um, go to the doctor when you have hearing loss? How do you enjoy the theater? There are so many things about life that are harder when you have hearing loss, but we can't let it hold us back. And so the, the most rewarding thing really has been to meet other people who are also struggling with this and sharing tips together. And we learn from each other and support one another. And I think that's the best way to move forward. Yeah, no, that is so cool. Um, I just, I think that's, that goes such a long way. You know, you, you never know um, who you're really impacting. And I imagine, you know, as a writer, when you get some of that feedback, um, that's just fuel knowing like, okay, I impacted one person's life and that's just the one person that reached out. I can't imagine how many other people's I did. Um, so super, super cool there. Uh, so Matt, let's transition over to you. Um, you've got a, a little bit of a different situation. Um, can you share the experience that, you know, you've gone through? Sure. Um, so I, I, my hearing was fine up until about 18. Um, for whatever reason, I got in my head that I wanted to go to West Point when I was in high school. Uh, mm -hmm. I went to take a West Point physical, and uh, I'll never forget the letter that said I had failed the physical uh, because of substandard auditory acuity, which is government speak for the kid can't hear very well. <laughs> uh, and uh, so that really changed my path. I ended up going to IU. We thought, well, you know, I've been around lawnmowers and uh, chainsaws and things growing up. And my dad was a shop teacher. So uh, I attributed to that. Uh, and then, like Sherry, when I got into college, uh, over the course of the semester, I quit being able to hear on, on, out of one ear on the phone. Mm -hmm. And I went to an audiologist in the outcome. They said, we think you need an MRI. Uh, so naturally, I assumed they were wrong because who goes to an audiologist and leaves with an MRI recommendation? Uh, I was very quickly and accurately diagnosed with neurofibromatosis 2, and the acronym for that is NF2, which is uh, if you have benign tumors growing on your hearing nerves on both sides. So acoustic neuromas are relatively common, uh, and one-sided one -sided acoustic neuroma is uh, certainly a challenge. Um, two is, is a little bit different. Uh, and so as those tumors quickly grew from about age 19 or 20 to 25, um, I ended up losing all of my hearing and, and in both sides and underwent um, a number of brain surgeries and spine surgeries because the tumors on my nerves also gr uh, had growing on my spine, which is a classic uh, symptom of NF2. And uh, you know, Sherry mentioned hoping it would skip a generation. I thought, well, you know, this, these, these things could happen, but they're not going to happen to me. 
-hmm. and it was kind of checking every box, everything that uh, NF2 could could impact impacted me. Um, so it was very difficult at 25. You know, you think you're going to be starting your life, and I moved to Chicago, and uh, the world's your oyster, right? You, you've got a, I've got a paycheck for the first time. Um, instead, I'm in a wheelchair with glasses, and my hearing aids are getting bigger and bigger. Uh, so it was a, it was certainly a reality check for me uh, in sort of the course of my life. I was very fortunate to have um, a company that uh, I felt like cared about me, and maybe more importantly, they had really great insurance. So I stuck with them for a long time. Uh, I was in sales. I moved into marketing research where I could do most of my job online. I, I learned uh, a lot about Excel. Uh, <laughs> this was right around the time that, you know, when I first started, we didn't have the internet. So all of a sudden you've got the internet and then you've got instant message uh, and then texting. Each one of these technologies that came out made my life measurably better. Interesting. Um, in the meantime, I started getting more involved with not-for-profits, doing fundraising uh, for NF2, raising money, raising awareness. Uh, and that was really where my heart was. The I loved what I was doing, but I, not enough to give up the insurance uh, that I had. And man, when you've got multiple brain tumors, insurances becomes just increasingly more important. Uh, <laughs> Around age 40, I got to a point where I thought, I, I really uh, need to make a move. You know, at what point do you look back with, with, with regret that you didn't follow your, your heart? Um, so my wife ended up with a job with great insurance and then so kind of took a leap uh, and ended up at Redux and having an opportunity to work with a local company that wanted to help people hear better uh, was an ideal scenario for me. Uh, it's a little bit surreal, and I haven't said this to Sherry ever before, so I'm going to embarrass her a little bit. Um, but when I started looking around to make that leap and was searching for maybe other people that have um, gotten in full time into hearing care, but maybe not selling hearing aids, uh, but had taken a non traditional route that allowed them to share their experience, um, Sherry, your website and some of the stories that you shared were the things that made me think, well, look what she's doing. So. I, I've always uh, admired that uh, about you. And I think uh, I take a lot of pride in having in making the most of the cards that I have been dealt. And I think up until, you know, my 40s, I thought that's you know, kind of how I was raised. And I thought that's what I'm supposed to be doing. And I look at Sherry, people like Sherry that uh, are out there saying, you know what? I don't really like these cards. Um, I, I'm going to push to get better cards. And it was almost like I didn't know I could do that. So when I see some of the stuff that Sherry does advocating for the hearing loss industry, it's really been a motivator for me to continue to push myself out of my comfort zone and uh, push for better technology, whether it's communication or hearing aid capability um, or learning about what, um, what Dave, what you do. Uh, so it's a little bit surreal for me to be on this call today because <laughs> you guys, you guys both impacted that change maybe more than you know. Wow. Well, thank sure, you, you want to say anything? That's so nice to hear. I appreciate that, and I think that you know the more of us that are empowered advocates, uh, the, the better it'll be for everyone with hearing loss. So that's great. Wow, that was totally unscripted and extremely cool. Thanks for sharing that, Matt. And I should say that um, Matt sent me prior to this call. He sent a. NPR story that he was featured on that everybody should go check out. I'll put it in the show notes. It's on KQED, which is Indiana's NPR affiliate station. Um, it's unbelievable. I mean, it gave me it goosebumps uh, talking about really Matt's story and the what he, you know, his soundtrack to his life. And, um, you know, I, it really resonated with me as somebody that, you know, he moved to Chicago in his early twenties. I moved to Chicago in my early twenties and I look at him as somebody that, you know, that could have been me. And, um, he's just a really normal guy that had this, um, had this really weird disease, you know, hit him. And, uh, I just think it's amazing that you've rolled with the punches the way that you have. And here you are today. Um, probably inspiring somebody that you don't know about. So I just think that's incredibly, incredibly cool. Um, so I think, you know, I, what would be kind of a cool way to transition here would be, Sherry, let's start with you. Um, can you talk about, you wear lyrics, right? Can you talk about that technology? Because I think that's a really interesting type of hearing aid uh, that 
probably isn't all that well known, um, you know, even in the industry. Yeah, that's true. It's a very unique product. It's an extended wear hearing aid. So I go to the audiologist and they put them in and then, you know, anywhere from six to eight to however many weeks later, I go back and, and get another pair. And there's definitely some pluses and minuses. They work great for me. Um, they're analog, which I really like. I think the sound quality is very natural. Um, and I also like the fact that I can wear them 24 seven which is something that, you know, for me, I also have tinnitus. And so it really helps me in terms of masking some of that annoying noise <laughs> that's yeah. in the background all the time. Um, but they don't have a lot of other, um, like, tech features. So I can't, you know, use Bluetooth to mm -hmm. uh, connect to the computer or T-coil or things like that. Um, but, you know, for me, I think everything in terms of hearing technology is a trade-off. And so they yeah. will great for me. And then I just use um, auxiliary devices to really help me in situations where I need more help. Interesting. And with the Lyric, if I understand it correctly, it, it doesn't, you don't remove it or anything for extended periods of time, right? Like you have it in there for, is it what, 15 days or is it a full month? It's anywhere from six to eight weeks is usually oh, wow. typical for me. So it was very interesting actually with the pandemic because with, um, audiologist offices being closed, I was very lucky. I have a really good relationship with my audiologist. And I said, you're going to have to give me some spares because yeah. it's going to be, you know, six to eight weeks before we know it. And I didn't want to have, you know, the inability to um, replace them and, and have another pair. So that was a great partnership. That's so interesting. Um, and so six to eight weeks and in, in the whole time, can you really feel it? Like, or does it become just sort of a, you know, like a, fan, a phantom limb where you just like, you don't even feel it anymore. It's funny because I don't feel like I'm feeling it, but when I take them out, it, it literally, every time I go, <sighs> so yeah. it's obvious that I, I'm aware of them somewhere, somehow in my body, but, um, you know, I can sleep on my ear now. I, um, so I don't, I'm not aware of feeling them, but they're, they're definitely in there. Interesting. So Matt, um, you are sort of on the opposite end of the spectrum. You're wearing the most computerized uh, device out there with a cochlear implant. Um, talk a little bit about this device because it really is a state-of-the-art piece of technology that I think is so freaking cool. Um, and I just want to highlight, you know, how it, how it works, how it actually gets installed, what the maintenance is like. Can you speak to that? Sure. Uh, and even turn it up an extra notch, uh, what I have is actually an auditory brainstem implant okay. made by Cochlear. So to give a very, and uh, any, any OD out there listening to this might cringe, but I'm going to give my Cliff's Notes version of this. <laughs> uh, there are different types of hearing loss, and if your hearing process has 10 steps, your nerve is step 10, you know, the nerve that connects to your brain. Well, unfortunately, that's where my damage was. So, a tradition, so I wore traditional hearing aids until the tumor got large enough that it fully um, uh, damaged that nerve. And eventually I had it removed and I had facial paralysis from where that nerve was totally severed. So my hearing aids could no longer work. A cochlear implant, let's say, might help a your cochlea, which is step five. Again, damage is at step 10. So my auditory brainstem implant looks just like a cochlear device. Um, but instead of uh, going through my cochlea, they, some very intelligent people said, this is the part of the brain stem that processes sound. So they sew a tiny little fly swatter of about 12 electrodes directly to your brain. And then you wait eight weeks and they turn it on, you know, for swelling to go down and uh, for your, your brain to heal. It was a very invasive uh, surgery because I had a tumor removed at the same time. It was about 10 hours long. And um, we thought, you know, if I live through surgery, that's, that's a win. Uh, anything that whether or not the implant works or not is just uh, gravy. So it was a very long eight weeks waiting to have that turned on. Um, and I was very fortunate that all the electrodes worked, um, that a, a very, like I said, a very intelligent doctor at the House Ear Institute in LA was able to determine exactly what part of my brainstem processes sound. And, uh, and they turned it on. And the best way I could describe it is things were very, very robotic and muffled. Um, it was almost like um, I went from not being able to see to being able to see in just one shade of dark gray. And then maybe you kind of uh, 
can make out something, but you don't know what it is, that a dog barking thing this sounded the same as a car horn honking. About every three or four months for the first few years, I went back and they would update it just like they do with a cochlear implant, and they would slowly adjust as your brain, because you're asking your body to do something it's not designed to do. Uh, as your brain start to say, okay, this is what's being expected of me, uh, and the diligence of practice, 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 I started listening to uh, Beatles songs that I knew before, even though I couldn't understand them. Um, that was sort of my benchmark. And now 15 years later, uh, with a combination of visual cues and speech understanding, I can probably pick up about 90% of what's being said uh, in a quiet environment. Uh, I went to a uh, minor league baseball game at the end of last summer, and I heard the ball hit the catcher's mitt. And it took three innings for me thinking, what is that sound? Because I'd forgotten that sound had existed in the world. Uh, once I identified it, I got to a point where I hoped the batter wouldn't swing because I just thought I forgot it existed. Uh, and it's, it's a beautiful noise. And I just think that's it's phenomenal to me. If somebody that couldn't hear it all to now from the end of the first baseline and being able to hear the leather on leather of a baseball hitting a mitt. So, uh, amazing technology and a lot of practice uh, has really helped me to come to rely on my implant. And I, it's got a lithium-ion rechargeable battery, and I'm, I'm talking to you now with the help of some voice recognition software, but the second I take this off, I'm totally deaf in both ears. Mm -hmm. So, right now, I can't hear the sound of my voice. As soon as I connect that magnet, my world, you know, I've got... 11 of 12 colors um, show back up in my head. Wow. That is absolutely amazing technology, to be perfectly frank. Um, what about music? How? Because I know like reading and listening to this Q, uh, this NPR story, you know, that you did, obviously music's been very, in, you know, important to you your whole life. What's it like now? I mean, is this something that you feel like you've been able to sort of capture back to some degree? Uh, for sure. I mean, uh, the, uh, fortunately I was not, I was, I was a terrible piano player. Uh, <laughs> I was, I was not somebody in my teens that like turned to music, uh, as a way to deal with things. Uh, so it wasn't like, you know, I lost this big part of my life, but I enjoyed music as much as anybody else. And, uh, like a lot of us, I got to college, was introduced to the Beatles and, so the music that I was really into when I lost my hearing was the, was also the music I wanted to turn to um, if I could hear music again. I wanted mm -hmm. to associate it with happy times in my life. And um, plus the Beatles have uh, it's some, some of the earlier Beatles, maybe more than the later Beatles, very clean, uh, easy to hear music. And it's taken a decade of practice doing that, maybe a little longer. Uh, but I'm now at a point where I have about 80 songs on a playlist and in my car, I can almost identify all of them when they come on without knowing what it's, what's coming. And then I can identify one or two notes. Uh, the rest of it all comes flooding back. Mm -hmm. uh, your, your brain says, oh, you know, I, I'm listening to Let It Be. And yeah. it, might, it might be the piano chords, you know, the ba ba ba, And and that's what uh, is, is like the... Um, Rosetta Stone for my brain and says those chords that's let it be now you know what's going to happen next so probably to my kids dismay uh, I haven't played anything in my car in their life uh, written after 2000 <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of the same thing over and over again uh, the uh, there's been a popular you know trend in uh, Rocket Man came out Bohemian Rhapsody came out mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm taken back now how emotional I get sometimes just watching those shows because I can hear what's being, you know, hear a little bit of what's being sung. I can yeah. see the person singing it, even if it's an actor portraying them, but I can see the person singing it and I have closed caption. So the combination of those three things allows me to hear, um, you know, I, I heard uh, Don't Let the Sun Go Down on Me two days ago when I watched Rocket Man for the first time ever. And, uh, my whole family's tired of me hearing the same three <laughs> because it was just, I told my wife, like there's this, there's all these treasures of music out there. Why aren't people just listening to this all the time? Um, 
So I, I certainly believe it's given me a, a appreciation for music, which is crazy to think that it took losing my hearing to appreciate music, but that's really where I am now. And so mm -hmm. uh, I have a new appreciation for it. It's, it's still a lot of music from the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Right. Um, that, that was a pretty great pretty great time for music so i'm not complaining right no that's uh, that's so interesting so you mentioned captioning there right so okay now let's start to get into a little bit about where we are today um you know sherry i think you've been a huge advocate for this i know you wrote an open letter to uh zoom about this and we're actually using zoom right now and i know that matt's using otter ai on the side to live transcribe this so he can both hear us but also kind of see in real time the captioning but captioning is obviously going to be something that I think is more and more uh, relevant um, and something that we as a, a society need to be more cognizant of. Um, so let's start with you, Sherry. Can you first talk about this open letter that you wrote and some of the progress? Because I know that you had a lot of people sign it, and I would love to just allow for you to speak to that, and then we'll get into some more caption-related topics from there. Yeah, so I think captioning is such an important issue, especially right now. It's really been brought on by the pandemic because so much of work life and social life has become on these platforms like Zoom, mm -hmm. like Google Meet. And I know myself, I was struggling and uh, my hearing loss peers were struggling. And so I just felt like it was important to let these companies know that this technology was needed. And that really, for people in, for, uh, with hearing loss, it should be free. I mean, it's really an accessibility issue. It's, mm -hmm. I like to say, you know, captions are our ramps. They <laughs> allow us to navigate this type of situation where ramps uh, allow people who use wheelchairs to navigate a lot of situations. So I wrote this open letter. Uh, it started out to Google and Zoom. Um, and then it turned into a petition. We now have 35,000 signatures. Wow. My husband keeps telling me is like two Madison Square Gardens or something. Yeah. So that's a lot of people. So I am really proud of how the hearing loss community has come together to really fight and, and advocate for what it is that they need. And so the good news is I think it's having, you know, some impact. Google Meet is now free for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, and that includes very high quality uh, auto captions. Mm -hmm. And Zoom is doing some beta testing, I think actually with Otter on some integrated um, captioning, but it still has not been rolled out. And it still is, you know, it, even when it is rolled out, um, hopefully that it would be free for people with hearing loss. It's just such an important way for people to be connected. And I think even for people who have typical hearing, Zoom fatigue is a real thing. It's very hard to concentrate and to follow along in a meeting where you're not face to face and you're not yeah. doing all those visual cues. And I think that, um, you know, maybe the silver lining in this is that captioning will become more of a normal activity for different types of communication settings in the future. That's at least my hope. That's such an interesting analogy that you used. It's the ramp uh, for you know folks with hearing loss. I've never thought of it that way, but that's such a good point. And I should note that we will put the uh, link to sign this petition in the show notes as well so that we can get it. You said it's currently at 36,000? 35,000. 35,000. Well, let's get it up to 36 yeah. and above. Yeah. Um, that's so, so cool. Um, so I'm curious, like from both of you, Matt, maybe we'll start with you. First of all, I want to know, what do you think is the best uh, captioning service out there today? And then also, I'm curious, you made a really interesting point there, Sherry, about all of the different facial cues and, and um, lip reading. And, you know, with this transition away from face to face, you know, how much do you two rely on these things of these, you know, nonverbal ways of communicating, you know, whether it be through just looking at people's facial gestures, lip reading, um, and anything else. I'm just really curious, like how dependent you are on those different tactics. Uh, uh, there's a lot of questions there. I thought we could let's just, we'll, I let's table the, um, let, we'll table the captioning and let's start with the second question. Uh, I, and, and I think uh, Sherry's point about this is not just a hard of hearing issue um, is so prevalent because 
if from a business standpoint, somebody might look at that and think, well, I, I can't justify an app for a thousand users. Uh, there's not anybody in my family and there's not any of my coworkers who don't use Otter now. Um, we use it because I don't, when I'm in a meeting, I can give somebody my undivided attention instead of having to spend time taking notes because it's taking notes for me. Uh, if we're in a big room, somebody always is going to miss something or somebody on the other side of the room laughed and you didn't get it because mm -hmm. you miss what the speaker was saying. Um, so Otter is very much an everyday tool. Um, for my, my 14 year olds have great hearing and, and they have a hard time watching a movie without caption because they feel like they're missing stuff. Um, so it is, you know, a, a more widespread uh, benefit than, than people might think. Uh, in terms of um, what I prefer, this might sound like a political answer, but it really is the truth. Uh, I have my preference because it fits my needs. And I think the very best thing about auto cap uh, different captioning tools, whether they call it voice to text or auto caption, or maybe it's a sprint cap tell, is we have choices. And, yeah. and a year ago, you were stuck with what, they're, what, with what was there. And it seems like every month somebody new is coming out with something and the users, we, we the public benefit from that. Um, so I use Otter because most of my calls are um, business oriented on a call like this, where I can have Zoom in one window and Otter in another. Uh, the reason I like Otter, it's accurate. Uh, it works in a big office. So if somebody's standing 20 feet away, um, I, I've been to a wedding on a rooftop of a boat last summer and otter allowed me to hear what the minister was saying four or five rows away outside so uh, i it, it meets my needs uh, i was just reviewing at launch this week um live transcribe for ios which is some is a third party uh app different than the google live transcribe for mm -hmm. android and and i reviewed that uh personally and uh it had very different functions than what Otter had. Um, but if I were having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with a hard of hearing grandparent, uh, that would absolutely be, it has functionality where you can flip your phone so it'll read upside down for the person that you're talking to in case they're the ones that are hard of hearing. Mm. Uh, it easily change the font. So uh, even though I use Otter, I think we all benefit from the fact that we have choices and almost all of them either have a free option or a free trial. So if you're thinking about using them, uh, one Google search of best voice to text is probably going to give you more options than you realize they were there. Uh, and I would encourage people to try and to figure out what, uh, what they feel is best. I pay $100 a year for Otter, and I probably will use 60,000 minutes. So uh, that's pretty efficient spend to me. Yeah. Uh, and then... Um, you mentioned masks, which is an irrelevant thing because that's also just one more need for maybe mm -hmm. having one of these uh, on your phone handy that you can use. Um, I'm worried about that. You know, everybody's kind of handling social distancing uh, a little bit different. And, and my wife and I talk a lot about um, it. It's almost like mourning in a way where there's no right way to do it. You know, you have to figure out what is you feel is best and safe for your family. There are certainly guidelines. Um, we have probably been on the more stringent side of that. Um, and so when I have occasionally ventured out to the grocery store, um, I had kind of did a whoa because I'm not sure yet how I'm going to operate in that kind of environment. Uh, I have calls with my team every day and uh, it's not a joke when I say I can communicate with them better on my couch with transcription and video than if we were in person because nobody's turning away nobody's leaving for coffee um i have a, and it, my room is quiet so going into the office it is going to be more challenging for me because instead of having those people right there in front of me they're going to be in masks and they're going to be right. turning away and doing 10 things so i think we're all going to learn together in that um i rely a lot on visual cues uh, i might get somebody says something and sherry you can probably relate to this um if I hear the word about or the phrase about pizza, my brain immediately says, <laughs> let's look at the surroundings. It's lunchtime. So they're probably asking if I want pizza. Um, I don't know if they're asking, do I like pizza? If they're telling me they hate pizza, if they said they've already ordered pizza or if I want extra. <laughs> it sounds so exhausting. I, 
And I see this happening, and this is what happened at my grocery store. As I checked out, the person in the mask clearly said something. I saw the mask move and I heard noise. And I thought, well, we're not, we're not going to be debating macroeconomics here. Um, she probably wants to know, do I want paper or plastic? Do I want to bag myself? Do I have any coupons? Or um, do I have my frequent shopper card? So I responded to that by answering all of those questions in one statement. <laughs> and she thought, this is a very thorough shopper. Um, <laughs> but I, I, it's going to be um, a challenge for a lot of us. Um, it, you know, I, I think I've read you lose 10 to 12 dBs with a mask. So people that think they might have okay hearing um, are probably soon going to realize they might need a little more help than they need than they realize. Yeah, that's a good point. Sherry, you want to add to all that? Yeah, I think the masks are real uh, are a big deal because if you think about hearing loss and and what it does for people, a lot of times it can be very isolating, and it's harder to understand speech. It's harder to communicate. So sometimes you opt out, and part of what I think as advocates, we have to encourage people to do is not opt out. But now, you know, we've come up with our strategies, but now we're out in the world and we have a new obstacle, which is the masks. And so we need to, as a community and advocates and audiologists and technologists, we need to figure out how are we going to battle this next obstacle, which for better or for worse is probably here to stay. So it's very hard for me because I do use lip reading and speech reading cues quite a bit in my communication. And I think people with typical hearing do as well. They maybe just don't rely on it as mm -hmm. much. But it helps to combat sort of that hearing loss exhaustion. When you have hearing loss, you're really expending a lot of effort as you're hearing. It's not like you can be doing um, you know, something else and hearing in the background. It's really mm -hmm. the activity that you're focused on. And lip reading provides extra clues as your brain sort of trying to process, like Matt said, you know, okay, I see the pizza, so that makes sense that they'd be asking me about that. So there's been a lot of discussion about um, clear masks mm -hmm. and um, you know, particularly in healthcare settings and, and other settings more socially. And so we'll see where that goes. Again, hopefully this is another opportunity really to raise awareness about communication issues for people with hearing loss and just for people in general. And yeah. so perhaps there's a silver lining that comes out of here, more awareness, and then um, you know, additional access to these masks where you can still get a little bit of the lip reading cues. Yeah, no, I think, um, you know, that's such a good point. You know, you said two things there that really stood out. It's this idea of exhaustion, like just hearing Matt talk about the way in which he has to co use context clues all the time. It sounds really taxing on your brain. And, you know, this idea too, that you have, there's probably a lot of people um, that, are suffering with hearing loss that are either in denial or they just haven't taken any action on it and over the course of maybe 10 years have developed um, subtle strategies that they're not even aware of, that they're reliant on. And so I do think that um, masks, I think in particular, and maybe, you know, with clear masks as a almost like a, a, you know, a signal um, to, to allow everybody to realize just how widespread this really is. Obviously, you two are using um, devices to combat your hearing loss, but there's so many people out there, and I think that it could make it a little bit more heightened in the public, um, you know, public awareness in general of just the fact that this is a, a communication issue, um, you know, brought on by the fact that now we're covering half of our faces and it's muffled too, you know, to a degree. So I thought yeah. now, um, go ahead, Matt. I was saying, um, we've mentioned a few times about the communication issue and then, and I 100% believe that what took, and, and that's what I thought when I got my hearing aids and, and implant was this will improve communication but that's almost just the superficial aspect of it because mm -hmm. while that is absolutely necessary, where it really helped me was uh, relationships. And, and so, uh, and you think about it, any communication is really a relationship. You know, sometimes it's just a video screen where, um, you know, Sherry, you and I have a certain relationship now because of the level of communication we've had in 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, but 
with other people, it can become a lot deeper. And when, um, when you lose the ability to communicate, it absolutely has impacted my relationships. Um, fortunately, as I have improved my ability to communicate, improved it, it has also improved those relationships. So it's not just, I want to hear what you're saying. I, I want to know who you are, what's going on with your life. And, and those are the things that really have make my life, you know, and I look back and the things that I want to remember in life, it's, it's those relationships. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm sure you guys have heard the phrase, fake it till you make it. And I think a lot of people with hearing loss, you know, I think of my dad and he spent 20 years uh, with the whole fake it till you make it. Uh, for kind of my news for those people is you're not making it. Like you, <laughs> you think you are because you don't know any better and you're trying hard. Um, but man, uh, my audiologists, my hearing care professionals have all been so great. I mean, over 20 years, I've never had a, a hearing care professional that I didn't walk away and think, I, I want to work with that person or be their friend. The only time I've ever left an audiologist is because we moved. Um, and I, so I would encourage anybody who is thinks they're, you know, so maybe it's their spouse or their children who say, remind them, you know, you think you're making it, you're not, uh, just go see somebody. Mm -hmm. And it, it shouldn't have this, isn't it? You're not going to the dentist, you know, there's nothing painful about this at all. It's very quick. It's very easy. These are incredibly caring professionals. And you can walk out same day with a pair of hearing aids that are probably going to make you hear better. And um, and if you don't like them, you go back and they give you a new fair and mm -hmm. you see if those work. And it's kind of like having choices with an app. There's so many choices, whether it's Lyric or if you're a qualified uh, cochlear implant candidate. There's so many options out there. I would encourage anybody to just make a little bit of an effort because um, the payoff is so significant compared to that effort. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I think that going all the way full circle here, you know, to what Sherry was saying with the stigma that her dad lived with and that um, she felt when she first, you know, sort of re recognized that she probably had a hearing loss. I mean, it's there's been so many different studies that have indicated this and that as to why the penetration rate's low. And yeah, I think cost is definitely prohibitive. And I hope that in time, um, cost and accessibility go down. But in my eyes, it really boils down to stigma. I think that it is a stigmatized, uh, you know, the problem is it's so pervasive and it's so widespread and it's gradual too. It's something that it doesn't, it's not like it just, you have it and then it's just like, okay, it's going to be like this. I mean, it's only going to get worse. And so I can't, I look at this whole thing and it's easy for me to say, because I'm, you know, I'm able-bodied, like I have good hearing, if you will. Um, I think I might have a little bit of a loss, but I think that it's something where we as a society, it, we, we have to recognize um, by and large, that this is something that is, it's totally normal. It's not like you, there's anything wrong with you or that you're a freak or anything like that. You know, in my eyes, it's no different than if you have glasses, you know, it's just exactly. the way that your body is. And I think that the sooner that we as a society can recognize that, the more people that will be open to um, just approaching this thing, because there is a seven year period before when, you know, that's the, the number that's uh, cited when people say like the time between when you recognize that you have some type of hearing loss and when you actually go and get it checked out. And that probably indicates that it's gotten really bad by the time that it's seven years from now. And um, it just seems to me like it's so obvious. And again, it's easy for me to say this, but it seems so obvious that we just need to be better as a society at recognizing that like this is something that a lot of people have and that there's nothing wrong with going and seeing a professional to get a diagnosis and see what that rehabilitation process looks like. Sherry, do you want to add anything to that? I think that's absolutely true. And I think the other thing that helps with stigma is to reach out to the hearing loss community and to find other peers and other people who have hearing loss. I found for me that once I found this peer group of other people, I had role models mm -hmm. of people who I could learn from. We shared tips and tricks with each other. And, you know, we commiserate with each other because 
no one can really understand what it's like to have hearing loss unless you have hearing loss. It's a very mm. nuanced experience. And so it's great to have those people that really understand that, uh, that experience and can, you know, just provide that support for you. I know Hearing Loss Association of America for me was really a, a life changer and I'm on mm. the board there now. And I think they're doing really important work in terms of ad advocacy, as well as just providing support for people so that they can move beyond this stigma and learn how to approach an audiologist and how to approach the technology that they need. So as we sort of close here, I wanted to focus on one last topic. And um, given my, um, you know, affinity for technology, uh, this is very much a technology oriented blog and podcast. I know that it's not a silver bullet. And I try to always temper my optimism about the progress around the technology. But I think Matt's a really good testament of what the technology can enable. Um, you know, when we're talking about something that is a true brain implant, um, that is allowing for a restoration of something that 30 years ago, 50 years ago wouldn't have been possible. Um, I'm curious to hear from you too. Matt, you had mentioned previously in uh, the conversation about how you use Otter, you know, you used it at a ceremony and you said like, it's like made a profound impact on you. Um, Sherry, let's start with you. What have been some of the things, I read a recent blog post that you wrote around using a, a Roger pen um, with uh, some, you know, some of your friends that also have hearing loss that wear hearing aids. Um, so some of these different accessories, some of these different apps, some of this different software that's become available today that I think can be um, really helpful and beneficial for uh, folks living with hearing loss. What, what are some of the things that stand out in your mind? Yeah, I love the fact that we have so many choices. I mean, I remember there was one time I was traveling overseas and my hearing aids just died. And there was really no way to get any other backup pair. But I was able to attach some uh, headphones to my smartphone and I used this app called Ear Machine. And it basically, let it was an am amplifier, it was a sound amplifier. Mm -hmm. and. It was definitely not as good as my, as my hearing aids. And I was sort of walking around, sticking my phone into the <laughs> mouth, you know, <laughs> speak into the microphone. Yeah. But what a miracle that I had that just at my disposal so easily. So mm -hmm. I think um, sound amplifier apps like that can be very helpful. I'm also a big uh, user of Otter <laughs> myself mm -hmm. and also live transcribe the Google version, I think is very, very accurate. So I, I just love the fact that we have all these tools at our disposal. Some of them, like Roger Pens, are made by hearing aid manufacturers and they're sort of more traditional type of things. But I think what's been interesting and exciting to see from a person with hearing losses perspective is just all the interest and sort of more of these over-the-counter or whatever you want to call them options, these mm -hmm. proliferation of apps. And so I think the more innovation there is in this space, the better off it is for people with hearing loss. Agree. Matt, what do you have to say to that? Uh, you know, certainly agree. The, uh, I'm just, as you were asking that question, I was looking at my setup here and I thought like uh, a video call, which was like Star Trek level stuff 50 years ago. Um, right. I have live transcription showing up on another screen. I have a, a Bluetooth enabled uh, speaker that is making it more clear than just my phone or computer sound might be. Um, you know, so I'm looking around at all these things and, and you know, uh, technologies. Well, here, a phrase I've used in the past, which sounds hokey, but there's never been a better time to be deaf. I mean, when <laughs> yeah. you think about it. Probably true, uh, though. The things that I do now didn't exist. I didn't have the capability to do that. Um, you know, I've, I've been in sales for 20 years really without missing a beat because as, as my hearing has declined, uh, the, the technologies tech has increased. So, you know, so I mentioned that I use Utter. Um, for 20 years, Sprint CapTel kept me connected. Uh, and then I remember when my big Sprint CapTel phone went, you know, they had an online portal. Um, I, I also, when we talk about choices, you know, there's different... Um, different types of software and different types of function, but also cost is a factor. So uh, the, and the reason I first started using Otter and Zoom is for limited call time, Otter or Zoom is free. For limited transcription time, Otter is free. 
uh, so the only investment I made was getting a little bit better speaker because I knew that helped me. Um, but I like that there are some wonderful tools out there that you can, or your, your mom or your grandma can all connect right now at no cost uh, within their home. So those are other considerations. And uh, Sprint, um, you know, it's, it's not uh, auto transcription. It's actually a, an individual uh, but most states offer that free. So the support is there. And, uh, and I find that to be a wonderful thing because, you know, I looked for a long time and, and couldn't find it. Sherry touched a little bit on the emotional component. Um, so while the tech support options are there, I think the, uh, the community support is there as well. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm grateful to see the, the tide rise across all of those. And to go back to a point I made earlier, uh, I'm, I'm grateful, you know, to Sherry and, and people like her that continue to push the envelope because to use another technology feature, I'm assuming the 35,000 signatures were not somebody going door to door with a clipboard. Mm -hmm. That's all done over technology platform. Um, I had an issue with Otter when I tried to get them connected on Otter premium through zoom premium. I, I sent them a note on Twitter and within an hour I got a call back and I was talking to somebody within the marketing department at Otter. So uh, we have these tech tools, but we also have a, a way to communicate, to continue pushing the envelope. Uh, and I think in my evolution as an individual, uh, I've gone from sort of worrying about my hearing loss to accepting my hearing loss to now pushing the envelope on what I can do with that experience. And Sherry's, Sherry was half a decade ahead of me on that. Um, cool. But that's going to make it better for all of us. So I would encourage people, if you have an issue with it, um, there's a lot of power in polite, constructive criticism. Yeah. Well, as we wrap up here, um, Sherry and Matt, where can we go to connect with you, learn more about, you know, both of your companies and both of what you do? Um, obviously, I think this will be something that resonates uh, with at least somebody out there that will find this to be something that they'll take to heart and, um, you know, look to connect with you too. So Sherry, where, where can people connect with you and, and anything else that you want to say as we close out here? Yeah, the, the best way definitely to connect with me is at my website, livingwithhearingloss.com. Um, I'm on Twitter as well. And you can email me at sherry at livingwithhearingloss.com. And I just appreciate you inviting me on this. It's always a great opportunity yeah. to meet other people with hearing loss and to share the patient perspective with the industry. So thank you. Yes, absolutely. Matt? Sure. Uh, so I mentioned in the beginning, I work for a company called Redux. So kind of shifting back to the technology aspect. Um, I mentioned all of my hearing care professionals were wonderful. All of my hearing aids have been great. The only problem I had with them was uh, I started getting into running, biking, swimming, and I would get my hearing aid wet. So the reason I joined Redux is they were taking a totally new technological approach to drawing hearing aids and making them sound better and making them last longer. Um, so I've been in sales for Redux for a little over a year, and that's probably the best way to reach me, uh, either at Matt, M-A-T-T, at Redux.com, R-E-D-U-X, uh, or you can visit our website, which is just Redux.com. Awesome. And yeah, he's kind of underplaying it. The uh, Redux technology is unbelievable. It uses a vacuum to dry the hearing aid, and I think Matt's like the the ultimate user of the device. He, he swore by it so much that he joined the company, right? Isn't that right? I cleaned out the garage yesterday and I had to use it last night on my own implant. So it saved me a trip back to the ENT. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, Sherry, Matt, thank you so much for coming on today. This was one of my favorite conversations I've had today. I'll definitely have to have you both on again at some point to give the listeners an update on what you're both doing. Uh, but thank you for joining and thanks for everybody who tuned in to the end. We will chat with you next time. Cheers. Right. Thank you, Dave. Thanks for tuning in today. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Future Ear Radio. For more content like this, just head over to futureear.co where you can read all the articles that I've been writing these past few years on the worlds of voice technology and hearables and how the two are beginning to intersect. Thanks for tuning in and I'll chat with you next time.